Good morning. Good morning. Hi, good morning. As many of you may know, I am Dr. Gail Gibson. I am the president of Essex County College, and it is my honor, my absolute pleasure, to welcome you to the first installment of the 2015-16 Presidential Lecture Series at Essex County College. I'd like to welcome all of our guests and extend a very special welcome to you, our Essex County College students, who are here today. The Presidential Lecture Series launched in February 2014 with the intention of providing our students and the entire college community with access to thought leaders who have achieved national and international prominence within their respective industries. Discussions that stem from the series are intended to inspire our students to become change agents and civic-minded leaders in their communities and their professions. As students and professors, we spend a lot of time reading and lecturing about those who have made such significant contributions to our society, but there's nothing like being able to take in their wisdom firsthand. In the past, the series featured great minds and talents such as the board certified emergency medicine physician and New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Samson Davis. We also had the author, historian, and professor, Mr. Junius Williams Esquire. We also had a renowned jazz and blues singer, Antoinette Montague. And of course, our own historian, educator, and author, and friend to Essex County College, the late, great Dr. Clement Price. But today, we are honored to have none other than the former New Jersey governor, James E. McGreevy, here to share with us this morning. Since time is of the essence, and I know this is our period from 1130 to 1250, I want to introduce today's lecturer. You may know that Jim McGreevy was the governor of New Jersey from 2002 to 2004. You may also know that he was born in Jersey City and graduated from Columbia University and earned his law degree from the Georgetown University. You may also know that he has a master's degree in education from Harvard University and a Master's of Divinity from the General Theological Seminary. You may also know that while he was governor, he launched a four-year literacy program designed to put reading coaches in elementary schools. He oversaw the management of an $8.6 billion school construction program to improve New Jersey school facilities. And he was responsible for overhauling New Jersey's automobile insurance industry. But what you probably don't know is he is the executive director of the Jersey City Employment and Training Program. And he works with Integrity House Program at the Hudson County Correctional Center in New Jersey where he guides and directs the center's spiritual counseling, as well as work with the women upon their discharge to secure mentorship. Something else you may not know, and this is just a little tidbit, he likes movies and he likes to run. And this year I was actually selected to be a board member of Integrity House, so I'll have the pleasure of working with former Governor McGreevy. So without further ado, I would like to present my friend, and he is a funny one, my friend, a man that I highly respect, the Honorable James E. McGreevy. Thank you. Yeah. You know, after that, one, I'm gonna say thank you to the president, give her a round of applause. I, I feel like, you ever see Charlie Brown? When like, you know, the teacher's talking, wah, 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 wah. Talking about Jim McGreevy's, Jim McGreevy's life, wah, wah, wah. But one, I want to thank the president. I want to thank her leadership. She's too kind. But I believe I'm appreciative of what she's doing on prison reentry because that's what I care about. 
And that's some of the issues that I grapple with every day. So when the president um, asked me uh, to come here to be, and she had great follow-up with her team. Where, where's, there she is. This is a whole team right here. This, this woman doesn't know how to stop calling. Um, <laughs> like, I don't want to go to Essex County, never mind. Um, <laughs> This woman kept calling and calling. You know, I, so I come here, right? I just left Jersey City, 398 MLK. President's looking splendid. No sandwich, no Coke, no bottle of water. Times are hard. <laughs> but in any event, so I'm just going to starve my way through this lecture. So you guys are going to get out soon like this. I'm going to steal the snatch that woman's bottle over there. All right, Elizabeth. Shay, you opened yours. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about reentry, which is what I do for a living. And after, I, after um, I was in the governor's office, and I, I went to seminary in New York, and I worked up in Harlem at a place called Exodus Transitional Ministry. See, like, I didn't know what to expect. I'm taking off this damn tie. Um, see, the shirt's too tight anyway. Um, so what I did is, so when I was in seminary, you have to do field education. So I went up, and I was up in Harlem, and I was working largely with men that had just spent huge amounts of time, um, that had done hard labor. I'm talking about 15, 16 years, and they were just coming back and looking for an opportunity. And I remember going up to Exodus every day, and thinking that these men and these women want the same thing that I want in life. What do they want? They want an opportunity. They want a place to put their heads down at night. They want to be able to eat. They want to be able to have a healthy life. And they want to be able to, to come back to their kids. So I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with my life and I became more and more fascinated. I had always been, you know, I was a prosecutor and I remember being a young prosecutor in Middlesex County after law school. My grandfather was a cop. He came off this boat from Ireland and needed a job and a pension, so that's what you did. But I remember being a young prosecutor and prosecuting kids for drug crimes and saying, this has got to be the stupidest thing I'm doing because I'm taking the, I'm taking the smartest kids and they're all capitalists, and they happen to be selling this thing called dope because they're in public housing. But that's the only thing that was going on in public housing. Because the schools sucked, there was no opportunity, and so they're, frankly, there were all these little capitalists. And I remember actually being asked to be transferred out of juvenile because I said there's got to be a better way than this. Putting these kids into county jail or state prison isn't accomplishing anything. And so I eventually went into sex crimes and prosecution. And then I came out, I worked for the state legislature. And after that, I worked for Merck and Company. I was mayor, of Wood I was in the state legislature. I was mayor of Woodbridge State Senate and then run for governor. And I always believed that, you know, that America could do better. I always believed I worked. I worked at a local YMCA in Rollway. I was like one of the few white kids. They used to, the kids used to cornrow my hair, and I was like, don't I look like these um, And I would go to these kids' houses, and, and they'd have cardboard furniture. They'd have boxes for furniture. And my family was like, you know, middle class, nothing fancy. But it was just sort of crazy. Now, I could do my economic spin about the 1% and how screwed up you know, our country is, that 1% of the population controls 90% of the wealth, and how screwed up that is. And I'm glad that, whether it's Pope Francis or Barack Obama speak to it, but damn, Congress should do something about it. Because when kids are hungry, you know, and I happen to be a Democrat, but there, I know there are, there are good Republicans. I'm, I'm still looking, no, I'm, um, but, <laughs> No, but I'm being serious, I have some that are friends that wouldn't let my sister marry. No. Um, but on a serious note, that when everybody does well, everybody does well. 
And that's a simple maxim. And that's the problem right now in our country, as I believe, is the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. But I'm not here to give that speech, because that speech is ugly. I'm here to talk about the reentry speech. And the reentry speech is actually hopeful, but let me give you some stats. We're 5% of the world's population. And you know what? I don't care what you say, but to be born in America, you hit the lottery. Born in America, hit the lottery. A thousand children will die today. Malaria and other diseases all across the world. If you're in this country, you're lucky. You've got health care, you have access to transportation, you have access to a free democratic process, although it's been compromised by the United decision and corporate spending. But this is still the greatest country in the world. You know, my grandparents came to this country from Ireland with nothing, and three generations later, I was elected governor. That doesn't happen anywhere but America. Look at Barack Obama's success. By the way, he was just in Brick City talking about reentry. You can give it up for the president. He's looking entirely too skinny. He's got to put some weight on. I was like, God, this guy's in shape. He's supposed to start getting like old and paunchy. But look, we're 5% of the world's population, but we lock up, we incarcerate 25% of the world's population. 5% of the world's population, but we're 25, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5 25% of the world's population, incarcerated population. So that means that we are locking up five times as many people, arguably as a percentage of the population that we should. We have the highest incarceration rate in the nation. We're number one. Number two is Russia. Yo, this is where we want to hang? This is a democracy? The greatest democracy in the history of the world? We're locking up more of our fellow citizens? You know, they talk about the 1% of the rich. Well, there's 1% of our fellow brothers and sisters that are locked up in prison. Now, before I give you my liberal rant, there are people in prison that should be in prison for the rest of their lives. There are ugly, bad dudes and gals in prison. But I'll make this argument. We incarcerate entirely too many people. I would make an argument, it's nuts. Because 70% the bottle of water. <laughs> Yo, when I get the turkey sandwich, we'll be really moving. Two waters, like whatever. Whatever, who wants water? I got two. Does anybody want one? You take it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Erica. So, if we've got 70% of the people behind bars, and they give you these little tacky little plastic cups. Here you go, Erica. Take a napkin, I won't use it. So, we got 70% of the people behind bars are addicts, right? So, if 70% of the people behind bars are addicts, what percentage? or 70% behind bars are addicts and or, and or alcoholics, what percentage of those addicts do you think receive treatment behind bars? Anybody, raise your hand. A quarter, Elizabeth. And <laughs> wrong. 1%, it's better than that, it's 11% nationally. So that means, say, say for example, 10%. So one out of 10 people get treatment, the other nine, what do they do? Get nothing. So what happens, what happens exactly? What happens when they get out? Yo, they go back, they run, they gun, and they dope. So if we have, if we're spending, you know how much we spend? We spend $74 billion with a B to lock up people in this country. You could pave the roads, you could provide for pre-kindergarten education, it costs between forty-five and fifty thousand dollars a year to lock somebody up. When a judge sends somebody to prison for twenty years, there's a cost. 
right? If he sends somebody to prison for five years at 50, 50,000, that's 250,000 dollars. 20 years, it's a million dollars. So you've got to understand the cost. There is an expensive cost. It's 74 billion with a B. That's a staggering cost. So this is a zero-sum game in government. If you're putting your money in incarceration, if you're putting your money in locking people up, if you're putting your money in the prison industrial complex, you're not spending money on education, you're not spending money on training, you're not spending your money on addiction treatment. So these are choices. Now, I'm not saying let everybody out of prison. That would be insane. But what I am saying for the 70% of people that are in prison that are addicts and are alcoholics, treatment, addiction is a disease. And it needs to be treated. And then for people who commit crimes, whether they're violent crimes, I work with people that were, were murderers and people that were drug felons every day. And remember, just keep this in the back of your head. 97% of the people locked up in America are getting out. 97%. 97%. So the 70% that are addicts, treatment, treatment, treatment. But for the remainder, they're also getting out. So what I'm suggesting is for the entirety is, is to have treatment clearly for those in prison and out. And well, I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing, but I'm also talking about is the importance of housing, structured sober housing, and then I'm also talking about the importance of employment and job training. And lastly, I'll start talking about identification and some of those challenges. So what we did in Jersey City with the second chance monies, we started a treatment program in, in jail. So instead of just hanging out and cussing and doing whatever you do, you can be in treatment. For the overwhelming number of women, they were victims of domestic abuse, sexual violence. I worked, worked with a young woman who grew up in, um, in Camden. Her grandfather happened to be a Camden police officer. Bless you. Her mother used to have her break into her grandfather's house to steal money for drugs. By the time she was 12 years old, she was raped six times. She told me she came home one day and she told her mother what it, had she been sexually assaulted. And her mother said, get back out there. And she said she sat in her bathtub and she washed herself. And she said, Jim, that's the last time I cried. Now she has two children of her own. But when that kind of emotional scarring takes place, people do crazy things to survive. She joined a gang as a means of survival. It wasn't choice. She didn't wake up and say, oh, this is Thursday. I think I'll join a gang. Her mother lost her house. Her grandparents moved out. She was alone in this world, and so she joined a gang. And then eventually, the gang does ugly, bad things. She never pulled a trigger. She never, never held a knife. But she was indicted as part of the conspiracy. And gratefully, we were able to negotiate with the prosecutor and the attorney general's office to bring down the sentencing. But the point is, I just want you to all get this. We all don't start. Yeah, that was one hell of a hiccup. <laughs> Lady in the red, yeah, and I saw it. And then she, and then she like looks around like nobody saw her. <laughs> Hiccups aren't about seeing, it's about hearing. Now that I just embarrassed her, the red shirt with the USA on, like right now. <laughs> Let's go the distance. Stand up, give your name. Hey! Hey, we're, we're all perfectly imperfect, right? Nobody's perfect in this crowd. Least of all me. But what happens is we all don't start the race of life from the same place. We all don't start this place. You know, this morning, you know, my daughter got her an egg, got her this, got a glass of milk, she took her pills, whatever. The young woman I worked with didn't have that that wasn't her experience. And so that we need to understand that if people are trying to 
traveled to a different place, we've got to help them. And so what happens so often in, in urban communities, drugs are not only a means of an ec economic exchange, they're a means of surviving. For some of the women that I worked with, they're also a way to deaden the pain. And frankly, there's always been a, a problem with dope in this country. Now that all of a sudden there's an addiction crisis because of opiates, of Vicodin and Percocet, and white people are dying, now all of a sudden everybody's focused on it. It is real. It's, it's awful. I get frustrated, I get angry, and I just like, you know, friends of mine are like, Jim, that's not going to do any good. But the point is, you've got to first understand the relationship between drugs and crime. Drugs and crime. That's a big piece of this. Drugs and crime. So 70% of the people behind bars are addicts. A lot of their crime is related to their addiction. You go down to Integrity House on Lincoln Park, where I used to work, and gals and guys would say that when they were active in chasing dope, 90% of their time was worrying about their next fix. Where they were going to get the money, where they were going to get the dope, where they were going to buy, and all the excitement. So obviously, treatment, treatment, treatment. We've got to treat people. If addiction is a disease, we have to treat it, both in jail and in prison and out. Second is housing. You know, Congress passed a bill that said if you're guilty of distribution, you can't get any welfare. You can't get any general assistance. And I'm sure that sounded great for a speech. I'm getting tough on drugs. They can't get any benefits. Well, yo, what is somebody supposed to do if they come out of jail and they want to change their life and they've got no place to live and they've got nothing to eat? What do you think they're going to do? They're going to go back to what they always did. And if you want to change people, you've got to give them an opportunity. So housing, housing, housing is important. And that's what we do in our program. We use general assistance to provide nine to 18 months of transitional housing. We do it in Jersey City with Mayor Fulop, and we're about to start with Mayor Baraka Raz. Then we're gonna do Patterson and then Ocean County. So what's so critically important is people need to have housing. Third piece is employment and training. Now, I know today if you have that F for felony, it's like a scarlet F. Nobody wants to give you a job. We tell all the men and women we work with to be honest, to say, this is what I did. And people have got to learn that the president, when he was here in Newark, said that he's going to do, he's going to ban the box on federal employment. But we've got to do that across the board in every county, in every city. There are cities in Essex County that won't hire an ex-offender to do public works. So all right, you all everybody talks a good game, give an offender a chance, he's picking up the garbage, why can't he do it if he had a conviction? Hello. And then the Port Authority of New York, I understand it if somebody's a terrorist, but if somebody's been guilty of distribution of CDS, they should still have an opportunity to work on the port. So employment is key, right? Because employment enables somebody to be self-sufficient for the future. And I'm proud of the fact what we've accomplished in Jersey City is that 62% of the people we work with have gotten jobs. You know, and truth be told, as Madam President, you know, people say, oh, they're murderers. You know, some guy who's been in prison for 16 years isn't going to go out and do that tomorrow. The biggest pains in the next are the young knuckleheads between 18 to 25 who think they got all the answers in the world and I like to smack them in the head and do, I, we, they're frequent flyers. They come in, they go out. They come in, they go out. You know, and they belong a gang, and too many of them are packing a gun, and they don't even think they're going to live past 30. And what I get frustrated is, so many of them have so much potential. But you ask them, well, what are your plans for life? And they're like, well, I'm going to be dead by the time I'm 30. And I feel like grabbing them and throwing them against the wall. Because you've got to believe, you've got to have a vision. You've got to have a future. You know, Henry Ford said, half of us think we've got a great future and half of we don't. 
And they're both right. It's what you believe in your head about yourself. So one, it's addiction treatment. Two, it's housing. Three, it's employment and training. But I also want to talk about a couple other pieces. Four, it's about the story. We all have a story. Everybody here has a story. What's your story, Elizabeth? Where were you born? Newark. Newark, housing, single parent. And you're here, where'd you go to high school? Or it's high school. What's your story? Ghana? Like, like, girl there clapped. <laughs> he clapped for his mother. He did George just sat there and cried. Ghana? Your family here? Where'd you go to high school? Hillside High School? Okay. So, and then what do you want to do with your life, George? Your dad's a police officer. What do you want to do? You want to be a police officer. All right? Steph, where are you born? Newark. Where'd you go to high school? Bloomfield High School. And what do you want to do with your life? You want to own your own PR firm? All right. You, right there. What's your name? No, the guy right there. The guy turned his head. Right there. <laughs> Next to Jabri. What's your name? Brent. Brent, where are you from? Where'd you go to high school? New York Collegiate Academy. What are you doing here besides taking up space? <laughs> what do you want to do with your life? If you could do anything, if you didn't have any fear, what would you do? A veterinarian. Well, damn, be a veterinarian! You know? You gotta live like, you know, as, as a Christian, I, you know, whether you're Muslim, whatever you are in life, damn be something. But it says in St. John's Gospel, perfect love casteth out all fear. At the end of the day, you're gonna live in love or you're gonna live out of fear. And fear comes in all sorts of ways. Fear is what other people tell you what you can't do or you can do. Fear is about what if you're, if you're in prison or you're in jail when you're wearing an orange jacket or a green jacket, it's what people tell you about yourself. So the narrative is important. Narrative, narrative, narrative. Story, story, story. Whether you look at the Quran or the will of Allah, you look at doing the will of God, love God with your heart, your whole soul, love thy neighbor. It's all about stories. What did human beings say? It's stories. Whether stories from the Iliad and the Odyssey. Where the stories of Mother Goose, where the stories of Aesop fables, stories is what we tell about ourselves. So you've got to have your own story. Your own story is so critically important because that story is going to tell you what you believe about yourself. So like when you roll a, a ball across the room, the ball is going to continue in that same direction. And so a lot of people feel they're confined by their past, right? I'm going to be a, always be a mother. I'm always going to be an addict. I'm never going to have a job. I'm always going to be in and out of jail. No, bullshit. Change the story. You have the power to change the story. So you just drove me. You just got me angry. Because you just said, what do you want to be? What do you want to be if you didn't have any fear? A veterinarian. Follow that passion, but damn it, it means hard work, right? But it means believing in yourself. So, so many of the people that I deal with in prison and jail have all these ideas, concepts in their head that somebody put in their head that they believe. And then what happens is they act out of it. You're a piece of shit, you're never going to do something, you're always going to be an addict, and you believe that. I'm not saying about you. I'm saying about, I'll get to your hand, put it down. But the thing is, you got to believe in yourself. you got to believe in yourself, right? See, like, when you're, in, when you're in prison, you're talking to people, you got, like, no time to make an impact. You just got to, like, talk, like, boom. So then, like, I go to these, I was with these federal district judges in Philadelphia, and a friend of mine invited me, Judge Orleo. 
And I talked just like this. I think they were like, can somebody escort this guy out of the room? So the fourth thing is the narrative. Fifth thing is for ex-offenders is identification. Now everybody here has identification, has a license, has a credit card. You come out of prison, what do you have? You got nothing. You got a DOC card. And that ain't worth blank in a couple of, in a couple of months. So try, try getting an apartment without any identification. Try getting a job without any identification. Try getting a birth certificate without any identification. Try getting a driver's license without any identification. It's like one of those like sci-fi ugly movies because you can't get identification. And if you are a legal immigrant, I said legal, you can't get anything. I was with somebody who came here to this country from the Dominican Republic when I was up in, in Harlem and I went to some state office in New York. I was like, I was gonna smash that glass window because somebody just wanted identification. They sat there and they did everything they're supposed to do for three hours. I'm like, whoa. So we have a great program with Ray Martinez, the Motor Vehicle Commission. So we help our people get identification, which is so important. And the last piece is cleaning up the wreckage of their lives, right? So when people are starting to do something new, new story, they still got to look behind them and look, that mess that you made, whether it was that party or that filthy room, when you're starting to do something, trying to do something new, you still got to clean up that wreckage. And so people have outstanding warrants, parole, probation, child support. And so we work with them. I know guys come out of prison 16 years and they're ducking their children's mom because they haven't paid child support. Like, we got to get this thing right. You just can't duck her and duck your kids for the next 10 years. And the what stupid system keeps putting on child support when the guy's in prison. Hello. He ain't going to pay anything. And I understand the mother's perspective. But at the end of the day, let's get a number that he can pay so he's not running and hiding and going to get arrested and wind up putting him back in jail because he didn't pay child support. Let's deal with what is. Let's deal with reality. Hello. And so that's what we do. So it's about addiction treatment. If you're, if you're active in your addiction, if you're active in your addiction alcoholism, you can't hold down a job, you can't be a good mother or father. So it's sobriety, sobriety. Second is you've got to understand housing. People have got to be secure that they've got a place to live. Third, it's about employment and training. Fourth, it's about your story, narratives. And that's why we read, we read from scripture, we read the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, it's about stories of redemption. Because if you want to change, you know, in, in, in AA and NA, we have an old saying, it sounds corny, but to me it works. Make a decision to turn your life and your will over to the care of God as you understand Him. Because at the end of the day, you're going to make decisions. And the idea is, are you going to make bad decisions or good decisions? And so if people have been making bad decisions their whole life, not because they're bad people, but that's what they were taught, they've got to make good decisions. Fourth is the importance of identification. I mean, fifth is important identification. Sixth is lawyers, 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 cleaning up the wreckage. Now let me just tell you, our recidivism numbers in Jersey City are 22%. So that's like one out of five go back. Nationally, it's like 66, 67 percent. So this works, but it's hard work, right? You got to make sure that people are getting their treatment. You got to make sure that people are sitting in a bottle. You got to make sure that people aren't doing a bag of dope. You got to make sure people live in instruction sober housing. You can't put people in a Section 8 house where the person next to them is doing a bag of dope and the person over here is taking Oxycontin. It doesn't work. It's got to be structured, sober housing. I say to my Republican friends, all three of them, that look at, hey, you should like this program because it's about discipline, it's about accountability, it's about old school, but it's changing people's behavior. You know, what I, what's so important in all of this is behavior, right? Because if you go to jail, you go to prison, frequently it's the biggest, baddest MF or dude who's, who's controlling that cell block. You ain't learning good things in prison about behavior. You're learning how to survive.
And I've got plenty of friends who did a lot of time. My best friend did a lot of time. And it was about surviving. It was about fighting. It was about not getting punked. It wasn't about learning good behavior. It wasn't about getting up in the morning, having your cup of coffee, putting on your clean clothes, and going to work. No, it was about making sure you didn't get shanked. I'm being serious. And it's about some crazy fellow inmate, some crazy correction officer, and trying to survive. So that isn't a good place to learn good behavior. Hello. That isn't a good place to learn healthy behavior. And that's what we try to do. So what I'm asking you is young people of privilege. You are privileged to be in this room. You are privileged to attend this college. You've got things going for you that the people that I work with would die for. You've got to know that. Yeah, and sure, there are people that have got it better, but I'm telling you, everybody in this room has got it. Nobody in this room is sweating what they're going to eat tonight. I have, with, my, with the clients I have, look, 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 look cause a little trouble up here, like look, look, Oklahoma. Orange, oh, figures. East orange or orange? It says it all. So, but what it understands is, to whom much is given, much is expected. And you guys have gifts. You guys have opportunity. What I'm, what I'm asking for you with humility and, and asking is, look, it, this stuff isn't going to get better by itself. Prison sucks. And what we're doing, we lock up more African Americans as a percentage of population than South Africa did black Africans at the height of apartheid. That's up. And, and you know what? And reentry is hard work, but for me, it's also about saving souls. It's giving people opportunities, saying you can do it differently. I had a woman that she had 16 felony convictions. She has her own apartment. She has her own car. She has her own job. And then in Jersey City, in Newport Mall, one of my favorite women is Barbara. Barbara did all sorts of hard time. And it, we have women make the jewelry. There's a great program called Same Sky. My friend Francine Lafrac runs it. It started in Rwanda after the genocide, people, women making jewelry. And I said, hey, you know, it's a blessing that you do this in Rwanda, but can you do it like in New Jersey for women in prison? And so we do it. It's called samesky.org.com. I don't know. But Same Sky. And now we've got women in Jersey City on MLK making jewelry, selling it all across America. So I'm just saying that for the next generation of Americans, I think this is a major social justice, civil rights issue. You know, Michelle Alexander wrote a great book. I'd encourage you all to read The New, you know, the new Jim Crow. I would encourage you all to read, look at disproportionate. I mean, all you have to do is walk through a county jail, walk through a state prison, and you see what's happening. But we can do this differently. And with young people, and young people politically involved, I don't mean political in the sense of partisan, Democrat or Republican politics. I mean people that are cared about that this country can do it better. Let me just wrap. It says in St. Matthew's Gospel, ye shall reap what ye shall sow. Ye shall reap what ye shall sow. That's an old expression for farming, right? If you sow corn, you're going to reap corn. If you're going to sow love, you're going to reap love. If you sow success, you're going to reap success. What are we sowing? We're sowing for so many of our young people inadequate educational opportunities, inadequate economic opportunities, abandonment, and kids are, and kids are joining gangs to survive. And people who've been in prison or jail, whether it's dope or drugs, they're just getting by, but they're not reaching the maximum of their potential. So I just ask each of you, I know this is hard. One of my favorite, favorite passages is in Deuteronomy and Exodus. When the Israelites have left slavery of Pharaoh in the middle of the desert, and they're like, hey, yo, Moses, this wasn't such a good idea. We had three square meals when we were under Pharaoh's care. We had a 
roof over a house. Yeah, sometimes freedom is tough. But it's also about accountability. It's also about lifting ourselves up, and it's also about dignity and self-respect. So I'm just asking each and every one of you, for the 1% of America, for the 2 million Americans that are behind bars, let's make America as good for them as it is for us. Thank you. I do. So anybody have any questions? Oh, yo, this guy, this kid, oh, young man over here, what's your name? Now, now see, he's, he's taken over the show, right? And I told you all he was a comedian. He has no censor for his mouth, he, but he is very, very passionate at what he does. And I think he brought us a very great message today about reentry, treatment, housing, employment, education, the narrative, identification, and if I can remember that, I want to tell you that you delivered a superb lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have time for questions? Yes, we do. We do have time for questions. He's always looking to engage, but I have to do the etiquette thing since he already talked about our water. You know, I want to, I really hey. want, and what? It's an old friend of mine. Of course, yes. She's actually the chairperson of our social science division here, the mighty My. social sciences. Yes, that is chairwoman Mamie Bridgeforth. I know Mamie. Ah, see? Um, and as you can tell, he likes to control, you know. So let me just take... Wait, wait, wait. Who says I like to control? All right. <laughs> let me just thank um, from my office and the organizers, Kaylin Dines, please Kaylin. stand, Nakisha Davis, Wally Eason, and I also like to thank all of the departments that work behind the scenes to make this happen, our graphics department, our MPT department, our auxiliary services and facilities, and I'd like to thank the faculty who brought their students. I saw Professor Davis walking around. She has her lecture style uh, group in here. I saw Professor Calfani. I saw Professor Pender Hughes. I saw so many faculty members. I want to thank you for bringing your students. And then I know he's going to laugh at this, but here's a little gift bag, and he'll probably make a little snide remark. But remember, when you have yeah, yeah. guests in your house, you always treat them with respect. So these are. Look, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> An empty water bottle, yo! I get Just it. a couple of tokens of Essex County College paraphernalia oh, um, for uh, Ma Governor McGreevy. And um, like I stated, we will be working together in Integrity House, and I'm really looking forward to that. And just to let you all know that we do have a reentry program at Essex. It's called the Next Step Program. <laughs> And I see Mr. David, David Hill, please stand for me. He is yeah, running let's hear that for David. program. Yeah, yeah. And David is one of our success stories, and he owns his own cleaning business, and now he's a full-time employee here at the college working on our grant for re-entry, and we are very proud of the work that you're doing. And we recently received another grant for a million dollars to continue to work, yes. To continue this most important work, and I want you to know that uh, when important. Governor McGreevy talked about working with the mayor and the city, that we are also providing um, one component, and that's going to be the education component for GED certificates, long-term, short-term training. So we are actually partnering together, and I'm very pleased. Now, without further ado, he loves questions. Well, you guys are the future, and I want to thank the president because. Uh, Essex County really stepped up in a, in, a, in a big way to help with our NORC program. So I want to thank the president for GED and for TAPE, and I want to thank David. So thank you. Okay. Any questions? A, a friend of mine told me that, in, a, a buddy of mine over, over here told me that they elected the first African-American like in, mayor in, in Burlington, and I nearly fell over. But I mean, like, hello. Yeah, there's racism. I mean, but, so the, the look at I go back to the serenity prayer. So the serenity prayer says, God, grant me the courage you know, to change the things I can. 
right? So I can't change every. What I can do is I can change me. I can change. I can change my daughters. I can change the world around. I can try to talk to Chandler. I can try to engage people. But I think what we do is is we try to live out our own vision. But yes, there is racism. But that doesn't mean we don't continue with the struggle. I mean, one of my favorite speeches of Martin King was not, I mean, I have a dream speech is an iconic speech, but my absolute favorite speech was a speech he gave in Memphis 24 hours before he died. And so really, but you can get it on YouTube. It's a really powerful speech. I still cry every time I see it. And he's like, King, King knew he was gonna die. I mean, there were all sorts of death threats. And basically he said, he said longevity has its place, living a long life has its place. But his point was, I don't fear any man because I'm doing God's will. And he, so he it basically was, when you do God's will in your life, when you do the right thing, that doesn't mean that you're not gonna be chastised, that doesn't mean you're not gonna be mocked, mocked. that doesn't mean you're not gonna be, have suffering. But if you do what's godly in your life, I believe, that's its own reward. And that's what King believed. And he actually says at the end of the speech, he says, I, fear, I don't fear any man, because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And that's how he ends the speech. And 24 hours later, he was killed. So I think for all of us, no matter how aggressive the world is, no matter how hateful the world is, what we should do is to live responsibly and live God godly. So in the back. So there, there's two questions that you asked, if I could break, tease it apart. One is for juvenile programs, and one is reentry programs. So on reentry programs, what I try to do is we partner with the church, whether it's you know, Metropolitan Baptist or St. James AME, but for juvenile programs, um, I think that you'd want to talk to, uh, you know, talk to City Hall, and I can, I can give you some people that I would talk to, to the mayor's office and see, and you know, you, so there's a proposal. I, you know, I know people get frustrated with this, but there's a pro, you have to go through a proposal process. Youth yeah, th yeah, exactly. You could go through the Youth Services Commission, but then I can also talk to um, your ward councilman and and grab me on the way out. All right. Very good. Sure. Um, the family reunification thing is that's a whole it's a whole different thing, right? One. You know, I try to change Dyfus, and I think we, we try, but it's just such a complex, ugly process. Um, arguably for benefit of the kids, but when the problem is when, or the challenge is when Dolores gets her life right and she's trying to do the right thing, it's like nobody's willing to revisit the issue. And then a lot of times it's the problem with the kids is that when somebody's been in prison or jail, you know, the kids, move on in their own heads in terms of their different attachments. So family reunification is really important and critical. Frankly, Dolores, it's not, because I only have so much time in a day and I just want to make sure, bluntly, that somebody has food and somebody has shelter and somebody has employment. My friend, Reverend Gloria Walton, at Most Excellent Way, she deals with the family reunification issues. That's how we work it in Jersey City. I mean, I have somebody else do it. She's an expert at it, she's good at it. Um, but let me talk to you privately about, in, in terms of, um, we're, we're looking probably um, Metropolitan Baptist, uh, Pastor David Jefferson is gonna be doing, working on those, some of those issues for us in Newark. Well, one, we gotta do more about expungement. The expungement process is awful, it sucks. And we've gotta streamline the expungement process. Uh, two, the governor, Governor Christie's been really great. He says he and I agree on one issue, and that's reentry. And I said, that's enough. He's been really supportive of, of funding. I uh, gave $5 million for reentry. I mean, the budget is, you know, whatever the budget, state budget is. But I mean, I was grateful for that. And so we're looking to expand. So the state provides money for drug treatment. The housing money comes out of general assistance for welfare. But unfortunately, Congress in Washington put the ban on people with drug distribution charges getting that. Um, Senator Cunningham from Hudson County, Sandy is trying to put in a bill that opts us out of that system. And labor and training, we're making headway. 
So I, I'm in there fighting every day. Uh, Speaker Prieto, Vinny Prieto has been great. Obviously, Raz has been great. Mayor Fulop, who I work for, has been tremendous. And it's like, you know what I, I say in good conscience? It's a really supported by both Republicans and Democrats. I mean, Tom Kane was in the vanguard long before many other people were. Um, so it, it's like, I'm there. But the thing that I'd really like to change is the expungement because that process, I, we don't do expungements at MLK, at our place, Martin's place, because it's so time consuming, it costs so much money. I'd have to have one attorney spend like four months with one client as opposed to 30 clients. I just tell people, I'm sorry, I don't do expungements because I mean, I'm, I'm helping people not get their asses thrown back in jail because of a, a child support payment that happened like two months ago or, or two years ago. So I just gotta deal with the emergency that is. But expungement, expungement, expungement's got to be changed. And also you guys. It's like, you know, really? I mean, this is, we're locking up 1% of our fellow citizens? People have got to put, people, you know, I, I sponsored the original bill to require insurance companies to cover mammograms. Right? Insurance companies, they pay all this cost for a radical mastectomy, but they wouldn't pay for a mammogram. To me, maybe this is an impolite analogy, but I think it's the same way. We're willing to, to do the, put somebody in prison, but we're not willing to help somebody with treatment, with housing, employment. Like, why is it that we're willing to do the most expensive thing in crisis, but we're not willing to do the, the less expensive thing that's more humane and makes sense? And, you know, reentry is hard work. I mean, I do this every day because I love it. But it's like, for me, the joy is transforming souls. But it's so much easier throwing somebody behind a concrete wall and barbed wire and say, I'll see you in 15 years. But we've got to be better than that. I think this is a moral cancer. And when Dolores stands up and others stand up and Dave stands up and says, look, it, there is another way, but it can't be just you know, a bus ticket and goodbye. If you're willing to spend $50,000 a year to lock me up per year, you're going to spend a fraction of that. As the old spiritual says, we all fall down, but we all get up. Thank you. Thank you all, and I will see you at the next presidential lecture series. Have a good day.